But the legacy of Al-Andalus was to affect more than the architecture of Europe. In the midst of this terrible struggle, something incredible was to happen, which would fire the minds of Europeans and expand our intellectual horizons. At the same time that it was being splintered by Christian encroachment, Al-Andalus was at the centre of one of the most influential shifts in thinking that Europe has ever seen. Between the Middle Ages and the modern era, Europe underwent a massive intellectual and cultural revolution. This shift, known as the Renaissance, transformed the human experience. It prompted the exploration of science and the arts and changed the way that men and women saw themselves in relation to God. The Renaissance and the scientific revolution that followed were critical stages in the development of Europe. The origins of the Renaissance are generally believed to lie in Italy, where a renewed interest in the classics had a huge impact on art and culture. But the foundations of the Renaissance were laid much earlier, and not in Italy, but in a town called Toledo in Islamic Spain. Toledo was one of Al-Andalus's vulnerable city-states, and in 1085, the Christians seized control of it. Unusually, the handover went very smoothly, and as a result, the Muslims already living in Toledo were allowed to remain as citizens and their mosques were left untouched. The city that emerged accommodated both Muslim and Christian. Spain at this time is a paradox. On one hand, tensions between Muslims and Christians are becoming unbearable, and yet on the other, there is a hugely beneficial intellectual evolution that is only possible because Muslims and Christians are living side by side. When Toledo fell to the Christians, its doors were opened to travelers and intellectuals from all over Europe. These people mixed with the Muslims in the city, learning their language and reading their books. Many of the adventurers came from England. In the late 1100s, an Englishman known as Daniel of Morley travelled to Europe to study. But as his autobiography reveals, he was disgusted with what he found there. I stopped a while in Paris, and there I saw asses rather than men, pretending to be very important. They had desks in front of them, heaving under the weight of two or three immovable tomes, but because they did not know anything, they were no better than marble statues. I did not want to get infected by a similar petrifaction, but when I heard that the doctrine of the Arabs was in fashion in Toledo, I hurried there as quickly as I could so that I could hear the wisest philosophers in the world. Just as the fall of Alexandria had made a massive body of Greek knowledge available to the Arabs 400 years previously, now the Christian conquest of Toledo passed this storehouse of knowledge on to Europeans who flocked here in their hundreds. At the backs of shops and in courtyards, groups of men started to gather together, Christians, Muslims and Jews, to work on texts that had been stored in the archives of mosques and churches. These were extraordinary manuscripts, translations of Aristotle and Plato and Euclid, as well as original works by Arabic mathematicians, astronomers and alchemists. This was a resource like no other in the rest of Europe. It was intellectual dynamite. People came from all over Europe. All these works that were lost in Europe could be found in Toledo. There was lots of wisdom here. How did the translators work together here in Toledo? In the first period, uh, there was uh, usually two people working together. And then another person who was learned in Latin would write it down in Latin. And uh, that was, I think, uh, the target of working together. And it was very clear. I think it really made it more accurate uh, because it, it was a teamwork. 
How long have these manuscripts been kept in Toledo? Well, most of the translations were carried out in the 12th and 13th century. That means uh, for almost 900 years, most of them. And here we have the preface in red. That's where we learn about the process of translation. In this case, we read that this book was translated by Ger of Cremona. It is a medical treatise by uh, Ibn Sina, by Avicenna, and it was uh, translated up Arabico from Arabic in Latinum, mm. into Latin, in Toledo. Yeah. It's a very rich document, isn't it? You, you get a sense of how valued these things were. And uh, there is all these little glosses on the right hand side. Uh, people have been adding comments or explaining words that were not clear. Un momento, por favor. Vamos a. Wow, that's a <laughs> splendid beast of a thing. Yeah, yeah. Is this a, it looks like it's a work of Aristotle, is it? Yeah, yeah, this is the Rhetorica by Aristotle. Rhetorica Aristotelis. And here we are, look, here's a man who's working on it. Hermanus Alemanus. Yeah, Hermann the German. Hermann the German. <laughs> yeah, even Germans came all the way to Toledo to find all these texts. And in this case, it is uh, a commentary by Averroes on the text of Aristotle. Ah. And both are translated together. So it's got added value because you've got new Arabic thought coming into the classical text. Yeah, they are adding, they are supplementing, uh, they are uh, completing what was uh, transmitted from the ancient world. Knowledge really is power at, that, at this time in history. It is. Isn't it? Having a book was something very, very valuable. <laughs> Do you find during this process that words slip from one language to another? Absolutely. Chemia. That word came into Western languages as chemistry. But we have another word, alchemy, that comes originally from Greek through Arabic. They added the article in Arabic, al, and that gave alchemy. English is full of words which came into the language from Arabic in this way. Many of them describe mathematical concepts which were completely new to Europe. Algorithms are named after an Arabic mathematician, and the concept of zero comes from the Arabic sifr, which means empty. It's where we get our word cipher from. But of course, the most obvious and lasting impact is the use of Arabic numerals. And in this Spanish Latin text, which dates from around about 986 AD, we have the first example of Arabic numerals written in Europe. Here they are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Imagine trying to do something like multiplication with Roman numerals. Once the numbers get above a certain amount, they are ridiculously unwieldy. This new, agile numerical system made everyday things like bookkeeping and accounting more accessible. Mathematics developed, and the construction of complex architectural projects became much easier. Recently, archaeologists renovating the roof timbers of Salisbury Cathedral in England made a discovery which clarifies this story. On some of the beams that support the roof, there are a series of numbers that were carved in around 1200 AD when the cathedral was built. Now, that's a three, and obviously it's familiar to us today, but in its time, it was a curious and progressive symbol. At this time, everyone in England was still using the clunky old Roman numerals, but here in the rafters of one cathedral, a new trend appears to have caught on. 
these numbers, the numbers that we use today, the fact that they're here is proof that the ordinary craftsmen who carved them benefited from an explosion of knowledge that started in Arabia and spread through Europe via Islamic Spain.